Hello, and welcome back to Unique's Digital Experience and Artificial Intelligence Week. This is day three. I'm Julian Wadsworth. And I'm Caroline Busta from New Models in Berlin. New Models is a media platform and community focused on the emergent effects of network technology on politics and society. We'd like to thank Unique very much for having us as your moderators. As New Models is rooted in the world of art and cultural production, with keen interest in how tech is shaping the way we think creatively, we are especially looking forward to today's program. We will spend this session in the part of the Venn diagram where human expression and machine learning overlap. And also thinking about a question that I might argue is as much sociological as it is philosophical. What we consider to be art in a time of neural nets and machine generated expression. For those who are just tuning in, Unique is the European Union National Institutes for Culture, the network of organizations from national cultural institutes to ministries of foreign affairs, engaging in cultural relations across the EU to strengthen dialogue, cultural, cultural cooperation, and diversity. Last night, Unique's Silicon Valley hosted a, a fascinating session stemming from their initiative, The Grid, on how art powers technology speaking to both leaders of Bay Area European cultural institutes and to creators and thinkers, including Patrick Hebron of Adobe's Machine Intelligence Design Group and Tobias Ries, director of the Bikrun Institute. In yesterday's earlier session, we meditated on the geopolitical implications of artificial intelligence with a primer course in AI defining some terms from Catherine Jarmul of Cape Privacy and a panel discussion with three high level experts in the field of machine learning and art of, uh, artificial intelligence and its ethical impact. Dataethics.eu co-founder Gri Hasselbach Professor of Law, Ethics, and Informatics at the University of Birmingham, Karen Young, and Martin Rochberger, who is uh, Rochbauer, <laughs> who is both the Austrian tech ambassador to Silicon Valley, as well as board member of the unique pilot project, The Grid. Uh, we want to just make a note that all of the previous sessions are now up on Unique Global's YouTube. You can find their YouTube by going to Unique global.eu and scrolling down to the bottom of the page and then clicking on the icons. You all know how to do this. Anyway, all the sessions are there as individual speaker sessions. So you can cherry pick which ones are most relevant to your interests. Um, during the talk last night, there was much discussion of how important it is to bring artists into the tech conversation, to listen to artists, to be inspired by the way they see the world. In a sense, of course, this is true and commendable. However, I would hope that in this session to come, we might problematize that sentiment in two ways. One, what does it mean when via machine learning, a non-human neural net can auto-generate expression that compels us to think differently? And two, how does the nature of art change when understood by its community as a communication tool or as a source of R&D? In today's session, which will go on till about 2 p.m. European time, we will- uh, CET -E time. C -E -T time. <laughs> Berlin time, we will begin with two experts thinking about creativity and artificial intelligence, Professor Marcus du Satoy and Octavio Kules, followed by a conversation with curator Marnie Benny, who works explicitly with artists involved in machine learning. And then a talk from an artist who works with machine learning, <laughs> Sophia Crespo. We would then like you to uh, we would then like to invite you to join us again tonight at 6 p.m. Central European time for live stream performances and conversations with and by artists Hexor Sistimos and Yena Sutella, both of whom work with and through machine learning. Before we begin, though, we just want to give a, a few, uh, like a brief overview of the tech. If this is day three for you, you're already very familiar with this, um, but it, whatever, we will still say it again. If you're, if you're uh, accessing this via Zoom, that's the primary format. You can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, please ask questions continuously throughout this. You, not, you don't need to wait till the end of the presentation. We will then look back through these questions and we will pose them to the speakers. Um, we welcome your comments and insights uh, as well. So uh, feel free to participate in the conversation uh, via questions or comments using the Q&A button in Zoom. And feel free to add links to the chat that you feel are relevant. Uh, we can really make this a community space, especially today as we're thinking about like building community through artistic expression. 
Um, at the end of this session, we will also ask you to join us or invite you to join us uh, on an ancillary platform we've been using called wonder.me. And Pedro, will, our, our person who's handling our tech, will uh, add the link to the chat at the end. This is sort of like an informal coffee break space where you can speak with some of the speakers who have time. You can speak with each other in a very interesting like geospatial interface, uh, which in any case is just interesting to check out if you're not already familiar with it. Um, also want to say a few credits. Uh, the curation and production of this week's event is due to the work of Jeanette Neustadt of the Goethe Institute. Um, the concept is by Gita Chalk of Unic. The technical production is by Pedro Yardim of New Kin Co. Animations and technical support by Tim Novikov. Graphic design by Amelie Bakker and Atelier Brenda. The coordination is Lina Kiryav. Uh, yeah, Roviate and Giacomo Corongio. I really hope I get this by the end. Um, and Rob <laughs> Grongio, Grongio. and Robert Keith and uh, the moderation, Caroline Busta, Julian Wadsworth of New Models. And we'll even put all these links to seed the uh, to seed the conversation into the chat right now. So here you go. Let's see. There you go. So there's some links to start off the chat. Um, all right, so now without further ado, we are going to hear from Professor Marcus Dusatoy and Octavio Kules. Each will give a presentation and then we will bring both on together for a short exchange. First up, we'd like to welcome Marcus Dusatoy, the Simoni Professor for the Public Understanding of Science and Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. He wrote The Music of the Primes, a book exploring the history and mysteries of prime number theory, and this year authored The Creativity Code, exploring the future and mysteries of creativity and machine learning. Can machine learning compose a great work of art? And if it does, what will the algorithms and mathematics behind artificial creativity teach us about our own creativity? Most importantly, Professor Dusatoy offers a vision of what machine learning creativity means for humans and perhaps what it means to be human itself. So Professor Marcus Dusatoy, hello from Berlin to London, where I believe you are in Quar. Um, the digital stage is now yours. Great. Well, it's uh, welcome. Uh, uh, great to join you all. And uh, I think the really little challenge here is whether AI can be creative at all. Um, I mean, after all, isn't creativity something which is about being uniquely human, exploring our own inner world, sharing those uh, with others? Um, how, how could AI be creative if actually the AI is originally written as code by a, a human? Um, and it's interesting, the first person to actually think about code to get machines to do interesting things, Ada Lovelace. Um, we celebrate Ada Lovelace Day every year in October. Um, she went uh, with her mother to see um, Charles Babbage's analytic engine, um, a machine which was being used to speed up mathematical calculations. And she already realized that this machine might be able to do sort of more interesting things and started writing instructions, which we now regard as the first sort of code to get a machine to, to do um, more interesting things than just mathematical calculations. Um, but already in those notes that she started writing, she's speculating about uh, the kind of limits of what this thing could do. And she wrote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So she's already thinking about the idea that this machine, given the right sort of code, um, could actually produce something uh, artistic, something that we generally regard as, as very human, music. Um, but she has a word of caution about uh, the creativity of the machine. She says, it's desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as the powers of the analytic engine. The machine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. And I think for many, many years, we've really felt that you know, it's the human writing the code. So if the machine produces some music, we really should credit um, the human as the creative one. The machine's just implemented the ideas of the human. And I think that's a very fair comment of the code in the past because 
code was written in a very sort of top-down manner. The human told the machine what to do. It may be able to implement it faster, deeper than a human can. But we, I've really seen a phase change in the way that we're writing code. And uh, this is something that's already been explored, uh, the idea of machine learning. The idea that um, a piece of code can interact with the world around it and through its interaction um, actually uh, change, mutate, update itself. Um, and this learning process, I think, is giving rise to the possibility um, that code can start to disconnect itself from the coder such that the output of the code um, we should really regard as um, the creativity of the code um, through its learning process, uh, learning on data, and that it isn't the original coder that we should regard uh, as the one, uh, the human who's, who, who's the creative one. And for me, uh, that the real phase change happened uh, where I really recognized that a moment of true AI creativity took place um, was in the context of a game. Uh, some of you may remember this story. It was the uh, when a piece of code called AlphaGo um, challenged uh, the world's best human at the game, ancient game of uh, Go. This is a game played on a 19 by 19 grid and players put black and white stones down and the aim is to try and enclose more of your opponent's territory than they are of yours. And traditionally, that was this is a game that was very hard to write code um, to, to play because uh, it's uh, the way that Go players played relied on a lot of intuition, creativity, pattern searching um, in the stones as they began to build up uh, on the board. Uh, and so traditionally, we weren't really able to write code to play this game. But with this idea of machine learning, where uh, the machine, the code can take old human games, analyze those, see which moves were somehow giving uh, a player an edge. Uh, when it ran out of human games, it tried it made synthetic games, uh, it started playing itself and updating the version that was more powerful and winning more often. Um, and so this produced a piece of code that was able to um, beat uh, Lee Sedol um, at this game. Uh, now, we got quite used to computers and AI doing things faster, better than humans, but what was really fascinating was something that happened in the second game of that match, um, because, uh, uh, this was a moment when I think that AlphaGo came up with a sort of move that uh, we'd never really seen before. Um, it was a move that traditionally is regarded as very weak. Um, so on the 37th move of game two, AlphaGo um, asked the human player to place a stone uh, down on the fifth row in from the edge. Interestingly, we still need humans to place the stones on the board because um, uh, this little bit of kit that we've uh, developed um, is actually better than any robot at the moment. Um, but the thinking was being done by the AI. Um, and I remember I was watching these games rather obsessively on uh, YouTube. And I remember the commentators um, gasping at what a terrible move the AlphaGo had made because early on in the game, you're not meant to play very deep into the board. It's sort of competition for kind of the edge of the board is what is regarded as good go playing. Um, and the human commentators thought, oh, well, uh, here's one for the humans to win now because uh, somehow a weak move like that, Lisa Dole will be able to completely demolish the code. But what turned out to happen was um, competition began to emerge for sort of uh, territory building up from the bottom right hand corner of the board. And it turned out that the person who laid that stone down, AlphaGo, the code, not a person actually, um, uh, on the 37th move was the one who controlled that whole area and won the game. And for me, this uh, passes three tests that I'm looking for um, if I'm going to call something creative. Um, I like a definition that Margaret Bowden, a cognitive scientist, came up with, and I think it's quite useful to take forward in this discussion. Um, she defined creativity as something which is new, surprising, and has value. So novelty is quite objective. We can judge that quite cleanly, but a surprise is interesting because that's engaging with our emotions where we get taken outside ourselves. And I think that's the exciting thing with uh, creativity in art. It is that kind of uh, 
helping us to see the world in a new way, that emotional uh, reaction uh, that you're trying to elicit to, to change the viewpoint of uh, the person looking or listening or reading the art. Um, and uh, But it shouldn't just be shock value for its own sake. It should have some sort of value uh, in the long run. And for me, that move really did have all of those three qualities. But the really crucial thing for me is that if a human had seen that line of code, play on the fifth row in from the edge. A human uh, would have said, well, that's a really bad move. Let's delete that line of code. Um, so for me, this, this uh, move really came out of the learning process of the code. The code understood how to use this move um, in a valuable way. And it's genuinely shifted the way that humans play this game. Uh, and I think that's the exciting role that um, AI will play in the realm of creativity is that I think humans, we often end up behaving uh, rather mechanistically. We repeat behaviors as creative artists. We've been successful with one thing in the past and we, it, 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 it's very easy to keep on using the same ideas. I know that I'm a mathematician and I very often fall back on old modes of thought that were successful. And what I find exciting is um, here's AlphaGo saying, you know, um, there is a way to exploit that move deep into the board to give you value. Um, and I think for me, we've seen Go players actually being shifted off what they thought was the peak way of playing, like a little hill. They thought it was a massive mountain, but the AI has cleared a fog around this hill and revealed um, much taller mountains around us, better ways to play this game. And so seeing this moment where I think that um, at this kind of broke love, Ada Lovelace's idea that um, it can't originate ever, anything. This truly did originate through its learning process, its interaction with data. Um, I think we're seeing something which needs to be credited as the creativity of the code. And it set me off on a, this journey to, to write this book, uh, The Creativity Code, because I was fascinated to know, okay, a game is a very restricted domain. Um, uh, what about things which are much more human, like music, as Ada Lovelace suggested, um, visual art, the written word, um, even my own subject of mathematics, which I regard as very creative. So um, in the book, I was very interested to see what the impact of this AI creativity has had on, on more human uh, realms. I think music was a fascinating one because music has some connections with kind of mathematics and the idea of pattern. And certainly we've seen AI picking up um, the idea of style and replicating things. But I was interested more in, in not just pastiche or uh, seeing things that we know already just more of the same. Uh, can AI take us into the new like um, the AI AlphaGo did in helping us to play this game in a new way. Um, and I was very fascinated in one story where um, Bernard Lubat, a, a pian jazz pianist, um, improvised alongside a, a jazz AI improviser that picked up um, uh, Bernard Lubat's style, started playing back things in, in his world. But it was Bernard Lubat's reaction. Uh, he said, well, I recognize that world. That is my world that it's playing but it's making suggestions of things to do with my world that I've never ever thought of doing before. And it, it's actually years ahead of what I might do. And for me, that's the exciting thing. AI being used as a tool to kick us out of um, a very sort of machine-like behaviors, perhaps making us creative again as humans. Um, the visual world is actually where I think machine learning has been uh, an AI through this machine learning process has been most successful, uh, learning on the huge amount of visuals, uh, but then moving into the new. And I've seen some very interesting art appearing from um, a new sort of algorithm called a generative adversarial network, which is actually two algorithms working against each other in a sort of game. And I think it actually mimics very nicely the way that uh, the human creative mind works, where there's one side which is very generative, bubbly, and the other side, which is a kind of discriminator, um, which is judging what's appearing. And these GANs uh, have started to push visuals really into um, a new realm. But interestingly, one of the stories I think is most important in the visual realm hasn't produced visually interesting art, but I think actually goes to the heart of why we humans make art, which is actually this idea 
of examining our inner worlds. Um, I, I, I like Carl Rogers, a psychologist idea of creativity is our tool to examine our conscious worlds and see whether my conscious world is anything like yours, um, whether my pain is anything like yours. And this code that's emerging is so complex and that we actually don't understand how it's thinking, how it's making up its mind about things. Well, mind, where does it have a mind? But decisions it's making. Um, for example, visual recognition software, it's able to recognize things, but what is it actually seeing? And a project called Deep Dream by Google um, actually used the visual production of the AI to sort of ask questions about what it was actually uh, seeing. And, and that for me is an interesting tool, um, not AI just to help humans, but humans to help to understand the inner world of AI. I think that's where art may play a very interesting role. One place that AI, I think, was very unsuccessful is in the written word, um, which uh, may be good news for me as a, uh, as a writer. Um, you know, can it write a book like this? Um, I'm just going to finish with a little passage because it was, I thought, uh, rather sweet in uh, AI trying to um, reproduce a new volume of Harry Potter. Um, Botnik uh, is a group in America, a group of coders and artists, and they love Harry Potter. There's enough perhaps data for people to learn on. And uh, so they they got the machine learning to, to learn on JK Rowling's world. And um, actually it started off pretty well. I, I love the title uh, the AI came up with. It was uh, the portrait of Harry Potter and the portrait of what looked like a large pile of ash. A great, great title for a novel. I'll read that one. Um, anyway, it started off quite well. Magic, it was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Well, pretty good. It's picked up that magic is a major theme in these books. Uh, leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Well, I love that idea. Leathery sheets of rain. I'm not sure I would come up with such a, a, a lovely image. So um, I think it's doing pretty well. But, but from that point on, it really began to lose the plot. Um, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. Um, he saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so I think uh, writers probably uh, are safe. J.K. Rowling's probably safe. And um, But I think there's an interesting role that uh, AI will be playing in the written word as well. Short form, it's actually quite good. I, I got actually a piece of AI to write 350 words of this book, and my editor even hasn't been able to identify the passage, which... I find vaguely depressing because I thought it was so obviously bad, but um, there you go. Um, but I think one of the interesting things for me will be as a writer, one of the frustrations is I have to write one book that works on many minds. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a collaboration with an AI which writes a bespoke book for each person because the AI knows the books that you've read, the things you know about. Perhaps you know what an algorithm is and I don't have to uh, talk about that. Perhaps you've never ever encountered an algorithm. So the idea of bespoke um, uh, creativity for the particular person because of knowing them, I think is a very interesting opportunity uh, that we might have ahead. And I think this is the exciting thing. This is, this is a period where we've got a new tool to examine the data that we have, our inner worlds. Um, and I think, uh, although Hollywood portrays AI as a kind of uh, very dystopically as a competitor, I think we need to regard AI as a very powerful collaborator going forward. And I think we're going to hear some interesting stories uh, during the morning uh, about the way that AI is helping artists to, to really push into the new. Thank you, Marcus. That's a fascinating, fascinating entry into this conversation. And I love this idea of AI not being something that we're competing with or something that is a threat to us, but rather the agent that allows us, that nudges us to be human. It opens up the capacity to think as humans, to think uh, nonlinearly, to, 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 uh, to think in ways that one cannot program. That's a beautiful way of saying it. I think we have one very quick question and, and then we'll hand the stage over to Octavio and then we'll bring you back on. But do you want to just ask the, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not that quick of a question. Oh, it's but I, it's I, not. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, thinking about our own, <laughs> I'm thinking about our own uh, sort of swarm intelligence, especially in the age of, of YouTube, where we uh, see uh, our artistic or creative practice sort of formalized into uh, Tutorial. tutorials and tropes uh, that we, sort of together 
discover what works the best in a very noisy and competitive uh, attention marketplace. And uh, you see us sort of repeating the things that work in a what would be thought of as maybe perhaps a more mechanistic than creative like Spotify, sort of mode. for instance, makes us do that, right? Right. It incentivizes particular um, ways of production. So I like the idea of AI being a disruptor of that. But I, I wanted to mention, I, I believe it was Douglas Hofstadter who, who said uh, analogy is the core of cognition. And I wonder where uh, analogy plays into uh, machine learning creativity. Uh, if it's capable of high level analogy and also where chaos uh, and that randomness uh, figures in because I, I almost feel like the creative process is a bit of randomness to break a, a, break a rule, uh, but also to, to make an analogy that still connects to the human. I'm not quite sure if machine learning is actually makes analogies too, too loose, like leathery rain, or um, if it's actually not so good at making analogies, and maybe you could clarify that a bit. Gosh, uh, so, <laughs> so many uh, things there uh, to tackle. I mean, I mean, let me just talk about chaos and randomness a little bit, because that's really fascinating, because quite often I saw that um, uh, people were putting, using randomness to give an illusion of a decision-making process going on, choices being made by the AI. And I think that's a cheat um, because uh, uh, that's coming from something external. And it, it's, um, it gives an illusion that there's something uh, interesting happening because you can't predict it, but, but also the AI can't predict that as well. But chaos is very different because chaos is uh, deterministic, but unpredictable. And, and that I think is the more interesting way that um, uh, code is tapping into uh, nonlinear um, uh, processes and, and producing uh, things which, you know, a very small perturbation by one person can take it off in a different direction. And I think that's very, uh, when you mentioned Spotify, the best algorithms, recommender algorithms are those that actually um, are chaotic in nature. So we aren't all being, I mean, my fear was recommender algorithms, we'd all be um, converging on the same pieces of music, same books, and it would uh, actually kill uh, the sort of smaller um, creative acts. But actually that's not happening. Uh, we're, I'm finding myself discovering things that I never would have, thanks to the kind of uh, very sensitive, chaotic nature of these recommenders. And analogy is very powerful, I think. So, uh, and I think, interestingly, you're seeing some AI uh, using, uh, you know, kind of learning style from one place, perhaps music, and then implementing it visually. And that's a very interesting sort of, uh, you know, you, you want to use um, sort of ideas in one realm and, and take them to another. I think that's often where analogy is very powerful, uh, certainly in science, an analogy or a metaphor for example. Um, so yeah, I think Douglas Hofstadter, uh, his, uh, I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Doug and uh, know him well. Uh, I, I think that, you know, he's, he's very critical of what AI, I mean, I, I had a conversation with him last year. He doesn't think AI can be creative at all. He's very down on uh, AI. Um, and he's got some very interesting uses of uh, translator algorithms which just totally miss the point uh, whilst we can pick up things i think that's interesting because we have a context a social um historical um uh, uh you know there's so much more data that we're tapping into especially with language which an ai very often is just limited in the data set it's being given and and, and that that is a big difference at the moment that we we have a sort of general intelligence and an ai is still quite narrow because of the data set it's being given I would offer also that humans have sometimes a hyper local data set, which is also very important to making art, which AI may or may not have. So I think that scale works in both directions. Yeah. But scale is a really interesting word there. And I think that's very important because you talked about um, swarm mentality. Uh, I think there's something that uh, AI is able to do at scale that we can't. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen in the digital humanities, the ability to tap into an AI that can read the whole of Victorian literature. <laughs> well, and then there are books which haven't been read by humans. Uh, and we got really focused on just a small number of great uh, Victorian novels, yet there are things in there that perhaps today are, are perhaps more relevant than they were um, in, in Victorian times. So I think, you know, using Absolutely. this in the digital humanities could, uh, you know, it, it gives us a, an ability to look at things at scale. I think it's a little bit like the moment suddenly Galileo was given a telescope. <laughs> and you could see things that you never could before. And that's the possibility we've got to ex explore. What can we see that we couldn't see before thanks to this technology? 
Love, lovely entree to this. Uh, Marcus, we're going to come back to you um, and we're going to hear from Octavio and maybe we'll bring what he's going to bring to the table back into the discussion. But gosh, you could have this conversation for another five hours and I'm sure it would only get more interesting. Um, thank you so much for that beginning. Stay tuned. Don't, don't go away yet. Um, we're going to bring on Octavio and then maybe in about 10 minutes, we'll bring you back on the digital stage. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we would now like to welcome Octavia Kules. The UNESCO S expert on cultural diversity, digital creativity, and artificial intelligence. Uh, Octavio founded the digital publishing house Teseo, one of the biggest in Latin America, and has researched the potential of digital publishing in developing countries. Today, he'll share insight, though, on the impact of AI on the arts and creative industries, outlining opportunities and challenges, and perhaps offer some policy uh, recommendations. <laughs> it's great to have action points in a yes, very speculation heavy field. Absolutely. So Octavio, we are, you are calling in now from Buenos Aires, if, that's, uh, if I understand correctly. So it's a little bit earlier in the morning there for you. Um, welcome, welcome to the unique digital stage. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Julian. I'm really happy to be here. And I will present um, a few slides. Uh, do you see the slides? Yes. Well, AI is dominating the headlines at the present time. There is a lot of discussion about uh, how AI will re revolutionize finance, health, education, manufacturing, mobility. But what about culture? Well, the, the relationship between AI and culture is usually overlooked. There is not much discussion about it. And this omission is very strange because actually when we use machine learning systems, we feed the machine with data. And in many cases, the data we use to feed the machines is made up of cultural expressions. Why? Suppose we, we feed the machines with photos, we feed the machines with text, videos, and songs. So those are cultural expressions. So culture serves usually as an input for machine learning systems. And culture is also an output of machine learning systems. Why? Because right now, hundreds or thousands of artists and creative entrepreneurs and companies are using AI to create or produce works in the field of music, visual arts, writing, and so on. So there is a, a very close relationship between AI and culture, and it's very, very important to, to discuss it. And what are the opportunities of um, using AI in the, in the arts and, and cultural sector? Well, Marcus mentioned some of them. Many, many artists I, I spoke with recognize that AI, um, like as if AI augmented their creativity, they feel enhanced with the use of AI ap applications. AI also lowers the entry barriers, especially for newcomers. Imagine people that don't know how, that don't have much expertise in music or in, in the creation, creation of film. Well, with these tools, they will be able to compose a symphony or to create a movie. It's also higher productivity for the creative industries. You, you can do much more with less. So it's, uh, you can reduce cost, et cetera. There are new services being created, new jobs, especially high skilled jobs. And this is also very beneficial for the public because we, as we are creating more and more cultural expressions, the, the audiences will have access to a larger variety of content. But we also have to identify the challenges. The, 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 the problems here are numerous. First of all, if it's, well, while it's true that the, the AI systems can lower the entry barriers, well, this can work maybe for a programmer or a person who knows um, some uh, coding or at least some, uh, they know how to use the tools. But for the so-called traditional artists, if you think of a guitar player 
of a painter with his or her brush, well, it's not re very realistic to ask them to follow a six-month co six course in machine learning. It's not really their job. So there is a, uh, uh, an entry bar barrier there for traditional artists. Also, there is a lack of data. If you use machine learning, you need massive amounts of data. And OK, we have public domain works. We have openly licensed uh, works of art. But there is a huge amount of data that is proprietary and is in the hands of private companies, big tech companies. So there is another challenge here. Another question, uh, and, and I saw it was uh, raised in the, in the chat by Stefanos. Who is the owner of the copyright of the, the works of art created by the means of AI? Because, OK, we can say it's the artist who used who, who used the AI application. But is it only that person who should be the, the, the right owner? Or maybe we should also include the programmer or any other person that created the software or the algorithm. And even we, we should include the people who created the massive amount of data we are using to feed the machine. Because if we are um, uh, using a, a system to create musics, music in the style of the Beatles, and we feed the machine with songs by the Beatles, we will have another a new song in that style. But shouldn't we create it, the Beatles, some way? Well, it's really, really a, a tough question to, to answer. And it's, uh, that's why I included in the, in the challenges. Another big problem is that while it's also true that AI will create high skilled jobs, it will also lead to the destruction and the massive destruction of jobs in the creative sectors. I'm thinking mainly of, uh, of translators, proofreaders, illustrators, designers, many of those of, of those jobs or part of those jobs will be replaced by machines very soon and this also this is also related to the problem of market concentration we we are witnessing here a very dangerous trend which is that these large tech companies the google apple amazon facebook netflix and many others not just in the West, but also in China, are um, becoming the, the de facto leaders in the cultural field, in the cultural ecosystem. So, and this is not really sustainable in the long run. Another problem is um, this challenge re related to the filter bubbles. We all know that uh, recommendation algorithms tend to Isolate, isolate users in their own tastes, previous tastes. So what will happen one day when companies will be able not just to recommend content to specific users, but also to create content for those individuals? We know that many. Uh, uh, of those plot platforms are hiring experts in AI, in creation with AI. So they will be able in a few years to create, for example, songs automatically and propose that song for a specific user. And that will cr 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 create a sort of perfect bubble around the user. And what will that mean in terms of social co co cohesion uh, when society is no longer um, working with shared values and shared meaning and common identities. So that's another, another issue, I think. And finally, last but not least, is the, the question of the gap between the global north and the global south. We, we usually think of the digital gap, which is a serious problem still today. 
because people in, in developed countries have more access to technologies and to, to digital skills than people in developing countries. But AI here is qualitatively, is adding, adding something qualitatively different because if you add AI in, in the equation, now it's not just a digital gap, it's also a creative gap. Why? Because a person who will have AI tools and will know how to use them will be much, much more creative by many orders of magnitude than a person that doesn't master these tools. So there are opportunities and there are many challenges. And within this context, I think um, we could think of many ideas and recommendations for, for the future to, to benefit from the opportunities and to mitigate the, the challenges. First of all, it will be essential to raise more awareness about how AI is impacting the cultural world. Uh, raise awareness among artists, among creative industries, among the public, among po policy makers. Also, it's uh, very important to, to provide training to those actors, especially to artists. And networking. Artists now need to network more with programmers, with uh, developers and web designers and data scientists, because it usually when, when I, um, I, I had several inter interviews with people working with AI in the arts, and the most successful cases are actually not um, only coming from individuals, but especially from collectives of, of collectives of, of arts. So um, I met the people from Obvious Art in France. They, they create paintings with the uh, GAN technology that Marcus mentioned. They sold this Edmond de Bellamy painting in Christie's uh, for more than 400,000 euros. And actually it's a group, they, they work as a group. One of them is an artist, pure artist. One of them is a, an expert in AI and another one is an expert in, in, in marketing. So networking is essential in, at this stage. We need also to strengthen the local data ecosystem because we need more data. We need also more research about these trends and especially more debate about the impact of large tech companies on the diversity of cultural expressions. And finally, um, in my view, it's um, crucial that in every country, the cultural sector uh, try to, they, they need to try to, they need to include the cultural perspective in the, into the AI national strategies. So every country now, most countries now are devising their own AI national plan. So how to deal with uh, education, finance, etc. But culture is usually um, not mentioned. And this is very risky. And the cultural sector needs to do something in order to integrate culture in those, into those plans. And also integrate, include culture in the um, declarations about the, on the ethics of AI. I had the opportunity to, to be part of the group of experts that drafted the first project of a global recommendation on the ethics of AI for UNESCO. Uh, there were 24 of us in the group. It was absolutely fascinating. We, we worked on this for several months um, earlier this year. And this is the only recommendation so far that includes culture as a key policy area. You can uh, visit the text and maybe later I can put it on the chat. So, so that's it for the opportunities, challenges and, and some ideas for the future. Thank you very much. So if you feel interested, these are my contact details and many of the, 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 the ideas I presented here are included in my papers that you will find them on my profile on academia.edu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Octavio. 
Um, it was very helpful to have, yes, some points looking towards the future as to what we might keep in mind as for a building policy or as cultural institutions, what we might keep in mind. Um, let's also bring Marcus back on the screen too. Or no, do you have questions well, for I, I Octavio? One, one, yeah, one, one particular policy question though for, for Octavio. Um, I mean, the, uh, you know, AI could sort of uh, de democratize or, or distribute uh, what uh, otherwise would be rather high, high level or, or intensive, difficult, creative processes. Um, and with remote access uh, to, to machines uh, and to processing power capable of running these neural nets or machine learning, um, you know, that, that could also be distributed widely as a 5G is adopted and as, as people would be able to essentially from their smartphone uh, rent remote access to machines capable of, of, of running uh, these neural networks and, and machine learning processes. And I want to know uh, if there is a, a plan or uh, perhaps a policy or a, any action points that may be taken to uh, help uh, maybe enable the, this, this act, remote access to powerful technology uh, to be distributed and, and made accessible to uh, a, a wide range of people, but particularly in the, in the global south. Yes, absolutely. Well, computing power and the access to, to AI solutions is becoming more and more um, uh, presented as a service. So you don't need to, to own the servers. And, but, and there are many projects, especially carried out by private companies. So it's, it, now it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to use those solutions. Like you, if you use the Google Cloud products or any other service uh, or Amazon Web Services, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, becoming more uh, democratized because you really, and, and in that case, you will be just a consumer, but you need also to have some kind of access and, and be the owner in a way to, of the whole life cycle of the, of the service you, you are providing. Otherwise, you, you will um, become very dependent on the solutions provided by third parties. So that's why I, it's it's very useful. It's uh, lowering prices, but I don't think it's the final solution for the democratization of AI on a global scale. Right. I, I mean, I believe it's a, certainly a space in, in which there could be uh, some public involvement to ensure that there's accessibility to to this technology, especially as it bec becomes actually, as you said, more cheaper and, and easier for people remotely to access as, as powerful of technology as, as anyone else. Uh, it's possible and yeah, I, I would hope to see uh, that public initiatives uh, help to uh, increase and, and make that access available. I have one question for both of you um, as a bridge question to our next speaker, who is a curator who works with um, artists who work with and through AI. Um, you know, we know the our toe quote, no one makes art but to get out of hell, right? And we know that art is going to be made with a, a pencil and paper about AI that is just as important as art that is made with AI to deal with AI. And so I wonder, as we're speaking now to an audience of, uh, of, of cultural institutions and leaders of cultural institutions, what we imagine the institutions um, or the houses for work that is dealing with AI and also that is made using AI. We know right now there's been, uh, in the past 10 years, we've seen a big shift in the art world. We've seen museums sort of fall out of calibration with the way artists are making art. And, uh, and I wonder if you can imagine even one or two changes or one or two uh, even programmatic shifts that institutions should be making to better, uh, to better calibrate to the questions of AI. Um, yeah. Well, I think um, digital literacy is going to be uh, a key component in here because, you know, uh, it's a case of, you know, uh, program or be programmed. And I think uh, that you need to be able to understand uh, um, how the AI is working. As, as Octavio illustrated, it's having impact on so many different areas of life and now on the, the sort of creative world as well. And, and I think there's an interesting element here which relates to the previous uh, question, actually. Um, I remember going to talk to Zaha Hadid um, for a program I made, um, and she complained about these architecture tools, which are amazing now and allow, you know, they democratized uh, the ability of people to come in and start 
uh, making buildings using this software. But she saw that the, all the buildings had a very similar sort of style and she employs, um, she did do, but they're still there um, in a um, practice. Uh, you know, a lot of coders who understand understood how to hack this and get inside the code. Um, so I think we're going to need tools, as I said in, in my presentation, to examine the inner world of the code um, as it makes its decisions, uh, impacts, you know, makes moral decisions, uh, in decisions that will, political decisions that will impact on us, uh, and creative uh, artistic decisions. So, so I think that digital literacy is, is going to be key. I love that digital literacy, but then also critics, like an AI critic. So if we have an AI artist, then we also need an AI kind of critic. Um, oh, and maybe Mark, Octavia wants to respond. There's also a question, um, but then I know we also should move on. How should we? Uh, if Octavia wants to respond. Yes, yeah. Octavia, would you like to respond to that as well? Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Marcus. Uh, digital literacy is key. Also um, foster more experiment, experimentation and networking. I've been participating in a cycle of webinars. I'm adding here in, on the chat the, the link, if you feel curious, um, on the, the impact of AI in the arts uh, and the creative industries in the Francophone uh, countries. Um, this is led by the International Organization of La Francophonie and Wallonie Bruxelles. So it's a cycle of five webinars and the the topics that come again and again, over and over again, are digital liter literacy, experimentation, networking, and uh, awareness. So th these are the, yeah, the, the most important areas in my view. Sounds great. I think the next question we might actually bring forward to to, um, to our next two speakers. Um, so because I think we're running a little bit behind schedule okay. and I think it would apply. I hope that's okay. We have a question from Marcus Huber. If it's okay if we apply that to the next conversation so that uh, we don't run out of too much time. Of course, again, we could continue this conversation on for hours. Um, Marcus and Octavio, thank you so much for spending your morning and afternoon with us. We're very grateful for your, uh, for your knowledge and for your time this morning. Um, and uh, we will hope Hopefully, see you in the internet, <laughs> um, and uh, and and do look out for Marcus's book um, and seek them both out if you'd like more information. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Octavio. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we'll say goodbye to you now. Yes, and... the uh, creativity code is out now. Yeah, yeah, the creativity code. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, we would now like to welcome to the stage Marnie Benny um, and Sophia Crespo, although I guess we will actually bring Sophia on um, after, after Marnie's talk. Yeah. Um, Marnie is an independent art curator and co-founder of AIArtist.org. You can look that up now. A nexus for artists working in machine learning or who have interest in the field and the institutions and corporations that are seeking artist input. She's curated and produced dozens of exhibitions and events that bring public awareness to new technologies and the, uh, their implications and questions they may raise. So Marnie, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, and, and actually for you, it's probably quite early because you're calling in from New York, as I understand. Yes, <laughs> but it's fine. This is a great conversation. I mean, usually I'm not this excited about talking at 7 a.m., but this is great so far. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And the stage is yours. Yeah, the stage is yours. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about AI artists and what your role in, in this conversation is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, again, this has been such an interesting conversation. And I think it's always great to have um, different people from different sectors that can sort of share their um, their knowledge and their input. Um, so uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm an independent curator and I focus in science and technology. And one of my most recent projects is AIartists.org. And what this platform does is serve for um, artists that are using AI, artists that are interested in using AI to learn how to use AI. We have a lot of tools that are there. Um, we have a lot of knowledge sharing and community building that we tried to do, um, connecting people and people can connect with each other. Uh, and then also uh, it's a great way for artists to show the work that they're doing. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the artists that uh, are on our site. And just before I start, I think something that's really interesting about, um, you know, as humans, we always like to categorize things and that can be tricky. But I think two things that artists do 
really, really well and why it's important that they're using this technology is one that they're exploring a lot of and highlighting a lot of the social um, justice issues that are going on. And they're basically highlighting more of the biases and, um, and uh, you know, this, this machine learning and AI technology just really kind of shows, it's, it's a mirror back to us as, as, as humans. And, you know, Marcus mentioned this uh, in his talk that artists are sort of constantly looking at us as a society, us as a human race um, and, you know, different sort of cultural um, ethnicities in different countries. And, and they're really sort of showing us who we are. And, I'm not sure it's, it's great sometimes and it's not great other times. Um, but I think it's very beneficial for that to be the case. And the other thing that I think uh, a, a lot of the artists that we, um, or that, I, that I've talked to that are using these technologies, uh, they're also exploring more so these, the collaboration between humans and machines, which is something that's really interesting. And then also be, through that collaboration, we're sort of determining more of, I think it shows us a little bit more of who we are sort of as humans and, and where that line is or, or sort of more often than not how blurred that line is. So anyway, just to start off with that, I'm gonna highlight a couple of projects um, from the artists that are on AIartist.org. Um, and actually I don't think all of them are on AIartist.org, but these are just interesting projects. Um, and they kind of, they cover uh, different, different things. So one is, is bias. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of coded bias in, in this machine learning software because it tends to be made by a very um, homogenous group of, of, of people. Um, privacy and surveillance, um, climate change, um, human collaboration. So again, kind of exploring human and machine collaboration and what, you know, how those lines are blurred and, and not blurred. Um, and then finally language. So I'm just gonna get started here. All right, so there's AIartist.org and there we go. Okay, so bias. So the first uh, project that I'm gonna talk about, this is Stephanie Dinkins and her project is called Not the Only One. This was a really fascinating uh, project that Stephanie did because she trained her own AI to make its own data set, which is really empowering, especially because she's a black woman and, and a black woman in America. And uh, this project was meant to sort of cre to create an AI database that focused on the black and brown experience and who tend to be uh, drastically underrepresented in the tech sector. So what she did is she, um, this is sort of this AI storyteller entity that she made. And what she's done is this AI, it's one AI as a storyteller that's been trained on three different data sets. And those three different data sets are three different family members. One starting with a, a, a woman who was born in 1932 in the South, uh, another with a woman who was born in the 60s, and then one with a third woman, with a third, uh, the third generation who was born in 1997. And so the AI has only learned from conversations that these family members have had, either with each other or other people, which is sort of a really fascinating um, way to show um, the story. So it's a narrative. So it's something that's interesting about it is, you know, you're learning through narrative, which is a, which is a cultural um, thing that we don't do very much, but it is very, um, it's, it's done in, um, you know, cultures in black and brown communities often. And then again, it's, it, it is, this data set is very, very different than the data sets that we would that we would normally find. Um, and it's more of a humanized data set, uh, which is which is just fascinating. So you can see, so this is how she's actually created it. One of, one of the things about artists that are using machine learning is the output. The output is is drastically different, and you'll see this in the artists that I'm that I highlight here. But um, here she has the, the profiles of the three family members, and then she's got, she has speakers on the bottom. 
of this platform so you can hear it from all sides and you can also look at look at the faces of these family members and see um and and kind of learn the interactions and what the ai is kind of um spitting uh is kind of uh you know saying um and one other thing that i should say is that that the ai is also continuously learning so when you go up <clears throat> to this ai storyteller when you speak to it, it will respond to you. And, um, you know, like Marcus was saying, and, um, you know, Octavia, it's not exactly, um, it, um, language is a bit tough for um, AI entities, but it's really interesting. Um, and it's in, um, and I actually had the, uh, the pleasure of, of visiting Stephanie in her studio when she was making this piece. And she actually, um, she did have the vessel, but it was just on the computer at that point. And it was really interesting because it was hearing our conversation and, and, and saying things um, and she was cracking up and it was, it was great because, you know, it's kind of a, like a, a, you don't know what, what you're going to get, but um, it's interesting. And when it's sort of um, from these vocabulary of, of a family is, it's, is, um, is, is, really uh, an, an interesting way to, to, to um, hear a narrative. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about privacy and surveillance. So this is Lauren McCarthy. And Lauren McCarthy basically it makes herself a human Amazon. So this is an installation performance piece that lasts for several days. Um, and it begins with an installation of custom designed uh, networked smart devices cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other electronic devices that are installed in people's houses. And they're real people that have, you know, willingly are participating in, in this. Um, and Lauren watches them on a video camera and is listening to them and um, is, is trying to do what Alexa does. And what she's really exploring here is, um, you know, the difference between like a machine and a human. And she's really interested in, is it better? And she, you know, it, the idea would be that a human would understand more or anticipate the needs more so than the AI would. And, you know, it's sort of a question that has an ongoing answer um, as, as far as I understand. Um, and here she's also uh, exploring the tensions between um, intimacy and privacy um, and convenience versus agency. Um, because, you know, these technologies are taking data all of the time from um, our, our homes. And often it is the machine that's listening, but there is, um, there is a human on the other end sometimes at Google or whatever, when there's issues that do listen in and they, I mean, they don't know who you are or whatever, but they're to know if the AI is doing, you know, a, a good job or not. This does happen sometimes. Um, but Lauren's more interested of this idea of intimacy um, and personal um, data. And, um, you know, just when, when you open your house up because you want it to be more convenient, just how, what, what is that line and how much of your data do they actually hear or know or, or what have you. Um, so that's a fantastic project there. This uh, project is about climate change. This is called Deep Swamp and it's made by Tega Brain. Um, she's a professor at NYU. And so it's a triptych of environments um, and together uh, that gather together wetland, wetland life formations. Um, and so there's, the, there's three different AI agents. It's Nicholas, Hans and Harrison. And they patiently watch their swamp territories and modify the conditions in them. So every few minutes, they're adjusting the light, the water, the fog, the nutrients, and they're trying to optimize um, their um, they're trying to optimize their environments. But they all have different goals. So Harrison aims for a natural-looking wetland. Hans is trying to produce a work of art, and Nicholas just wants attention. Um, and so this is just a fun. I mean, I love Tega Brain's work because she is. Um, um, you know, poignant and, and also kind of funny um, and, and um, you know, sets up these sort of experiments to see, you know, what, what would it look like, um, you know, if AIs were, you know, taking care and stewards of the environment and, you know, going the way we are, that could be a possibility. And she's sort of 
showing that and, and, and questioning and questioning that. Um, and then another thing, another aspect of this that I find very, very interesting is when you optimize and when you're, you know, having when the goal and you're using a machine and using machine learning is to optimize what is that optimization and who is that optimization for? And that kind of gets back to more of those social justice constructs, like who gets to make those choices. Um, so that's a great highlighter. Okay, and here's more a human machine collaboration, which is, you know, again, sort of, I, I think, you know, humans, we're just always trying to figure ourselves out really at the end of the day. And I think machine learning really um, gives us another, another tool there. Um, so this is Su Gwen Chung. And what she's done is she's trained all these mini sort of these mini robots on on her brush strokes and also to collaborate with her um, through different data sets. One being sort of um, she's used surveillance footage of of um, New York City streets and sort of the swarm factor that people have when they're walking um, the streets there. Um, and she's she's she does this. The, her goal is to understand her own engagement um, to technological complexity, um, and that is shown to her by this sort of like a, other body, this sort of multi-agent body, as she calls it. Um, and she's also one of the other things that I think is really interesting, and uh, that she's found through her work is that you know it's new relationships. So these machines are constantly learning, and she's constantly learning from them. So they are actually teaching each other or, or collaborating with each other. They're learning from each other. Um, and, it's, and it's changing their actions. So I think that's an also just fascinating. Um, and this is Reaps One. And he was, uh, he was, this image is the Nokia Bell Labs uh, in New Jersey. They have an anabolic uh, sound chamber, which is a chamber that takes all sound out of the room. It's not, it's, it's a little bit older, so it's not um, the top sound chamber, the anti-sound chamber or anabolic sound chamber anymore, but um, it's, it's really amazing being there. Um, and so what, what they did when they were working together with Reef Swan, and what's interesting to also highlight about this is that they're a technology company and they are, um, they are constantly creating connection technology and um, they have a very robust and I think successful, um, and artists feel this way too, a very successful relationship with artists, a residency program, and then they have a long-term residency program. And there's a lot of value for them to have a long-term relationship with an artist um, who is sort of working with them as a part of their teams to create new technologies. So I'll leave that there and you can, um, it's EAT, it's E-A-T and Nokia Bell Labs and they do a lot of really amazing um, projects. But with this, Re uh, Reaps One is a beatboxer. And so what he's done is train um, his AI on his beatboxing. And basically what is happening, what happens then is that he'll, uh, he's, they set up sort of a call and response thing with the AI. So he'll beatbox and then the AI will beatbox back. And this has been extremely um, beneficial uh, for Reaps One because he is able to kind of riff with this entity that is trained on his own uh, style, but never would makes decisions that he would never make, kind of like uh, Go. Um, you know, where it was like, wow, well, what, why, how did it start that way? But, you know, through these technologies where, where humans are often, you know, shown sort of a different way that they wouldn't necessarily think of. And for him, it was largely inspirational and, and, and a really positive experience. And the last project that I'll talk about is um, Please Feed the Lions which Google Arts and Culture helped produce, uh, but they worked with uh, a multidisciplinary artist, um, Ace uh, Devlin, and Ross Goodwin is the Google employee who helped sort of write this code. Um, and this is in Trafalgar Square, um, where uh, in, in 1867, there's four monumental lions in Trafalgar Square, which is sort of these, these very um, iconic images and they've been sitting silent sort of at the base of Nelson's column for, a, you know, 150 years or so. And um, so what they did is sort of overnight, they added this um, 
fluorescent red lion and um and they made it a completely interactive poetry piece so people could uh you know tweet at or uh send in their poetry and their information and it would in the daytime um be sort of in the lion's mouth there and at nighttime the poetry would be would be um projected on the outside and um you know so the idea here is it's just sort of like you know this this conversation and this sort of public conversation um with people and 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 poetry and language all right, so I will stop there. Um, Thank you, Marnie. That was I'll, great. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. It, it may be like concluding remarks. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No. So, um, you know, these were just a couple of um, examples of the really amazing work that artists are doing with this technology and, um, you know, a lot of and raising a lot of questions. And I think that that's one thing that I mean, I got into art for uh, for that reason. I think artists are, are um, they're constantly sort of showing us who we are and a mirror up to society and especially with with technology and how quickly technology is going and especially this technology there's a lot of um things that we need to consider um and a lot of benefits and a lot of you know things we need to consider and um, proactively think about um so thank you great thank you very much we'll come back to you um after sophia's presentation and then we can speak with you both together so we have a curatorial perspective and we have an artist perspective at the same time um so thank you for that presentation we will now bring on mm -hmm. sophia crespo who's actually part of aiartist.org um so marnie and sophia work together uh, behind the scenes and we'll hear more about that after sophia's talk um sophia crespo is an artist a, a neural artist to be precise whose uh, practice integrates machine learning her inspiration and subject is nature. Uh, she envisions artificial life and generative life forms, and through her work suggests that technology and nature are much more closely related than the dualistic way we often tend to think of them. So yes, and I think we should all remember that like AI is in a way part of nature. We're creating it. I mean, this is this continuum. It's it's not, I mean, we call it artificial, but like by what metric? And anyway, I think Sophia is about to problematize that a bit for us. Sophia, you're calling in from Berlin along with us. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So... Well the stage is now yours, so go for it. Well thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm gonna share with you some of my uh, presentation and journey into AI arts. And mainly what I'm going to talk about is the questions that I ask myself um, and I don't have answers for all of them. So, um, but for me, it started visually, um, I work, uh, with a very strong visual driven intuition. And for me, this fascination with nature started not just from the perspective of how amazing biological systems can be, but also the beauty of geometry and the math um, underlying that geometry and the beauty that the harmony that we find in all these parts that make perfect sense when we look at them. So, um, for example, here in the middle is one of the things that I generated, one of the creatures, so to say, and it's generated based on a data set of seashells. And as you can see, it inherited that shape of the golden ratio, basically. Um, so one of the uh, things that I ask myself is where does an image uh, begin to communicate beauty to me? Where is beauty an emergent property um, of, the, of the image? Because when we zoom in, we see the computer understands an image as a race of values and that they're in a color image, for example, those uh, values are arranged in channels, for example, RGB. And when we look at these values, we think, um, okay, these are just numbers, where's the beauty? But as soon as we zoom out, um, we understand the image and suddenly it makes sense to us. But if we had to just stare at the values, we wouldn't be able to understand what's happening there unless we have a computer to decode that. 
And I think there's something beautiful to that as well, to the way that we found a computational way of representing images. And another thing, as I was saying before, is that a lot of the a lot of the things that I work with, a lot of the things I generate end up looking beautiful. So to say, I mean, at least to me, but I ask myself if those things are beautiful because the original data set was beautiful and is beauty an inherent thing or, or a property that gets transferred from a data set onto a final output. So can beauty be a transferable feature? Um, and part of the med meditative process of working with uh, neural networks is that I have to create sometimes this really, really large data sets and I do them by hand sometimes, or sometimes I, um, I use uh, like a scraping tool, download uh, an open source data set. And I spend hours just looking at beautiful sea creatures, for instance. And that's part of the meditative process that I think with the previous art practices that I had before, I didn't get to have that to, I wasn't forced to do this in this way, um, to spend so many hours just collecting single images and curating them and putting them together. And another aspect of the practice that was completely new to me um, was the, the fact that I had to wait, I had to practice patience uh, to, to generate an image. I wasn't able to render something and see it in real time. And I learned to somehow romanticize that that process. I know that machine learning engineers maybe don't find this as romantic <laughs> as I do, but there's something interesting in just having to wait and see little by little how the image is being processed and how an algorithm is trying to extract patterns from it and how it learns basically. Um, and another of the of the things that have inspired me a lot and where I ask myself is the is this the beautiful thing of working with neural networks is that they vaguely they're they were inspired by neuroscientific research and the way that the the neurons in the visual cortex of cats were able to detect patterns for example so this isn't to say that artificial neural networks are directly trying to model a neuron because that would be a different field that would be um, computational neuroscience but nevertheless i think there is something beautiful to the way that um that artificial neural networks uh work to uh, in the lower level so to summarize my workflow basically it starts with an input a data set and that can be from 20 images a single image or can be um it got to 500,000 images once that was the maximum it ever uh, got to and these images get fed onto a neural network so i'm able to uh, beforehand, I can normalize the data set and prepare it. And that's something that I learned with practice, uh, trial and error, basically. And then in this, um, in the more programmatic part of it, I can tweak parameters and choose, depending what technique I'm working with, kind of modify the, the parameters to change at the output. And then the output is kind of an exploration. I see it a lot as a cur uh, cur curatorial part of the process too, because uh, sometimes the, the amount of variations that we can generate is so large that I need to um, take some time off and leave sometimes a folder there untouched and then go back to it a week later and look at it with fresh eyes or to try to select from it because it can be really overwhelming uh, when you have so much variety. But that's something that I find really thrilling um, and mentally stimulating 
about the, the randomness of the generative process that doesn't just exist in the machine learning practice, but I think lots of generative art uh, artists have talked about this, including Vera Molnar, for instance, um, who is currently 95, I think, or 98, and she's like one of the precursors of generative art. And she talks about how the, the beauty of the um, the beauty of the randomness that we can generate using a program rather than trying to, you know, for example, draw an image or use our own brain to um, to do it. So there's something beautiful about the mechanical and the automation, the automat automotive process. Okay, so um, jumping onto the the thoughts I have about this practice and I want to kind of ask you if you can imagine a color that you've never seen before. I've tried this. Um, I, I tried this several times and I failed to do that. And at some point I asked myself, why? Um, why can I not at least imagine? I mean, I know that the mantis shrimp can see so many more color frequencies that we can and those color frequencies are there but our eyes cannot decode that information we cannot um we cannot imagine it and why is it that i cannot imagine can i only imagine things from the data set of experiences uh perceptual experience that i've been given so this led me to to ask myself um okay, well, in the same way that I can only imagine new color combinations based on the colors that I've already seen, similarly, the neural network can only create with um, the data set that it's seen. Um, and there is a parallel there in a way. Um, isn't all art made by humans and execution or reshaping of data absorbed through biological neurons? Um, this is something I I ask myself eventually, um, but this doesn't um, this doesn't mean that I'm trying to say that a machine is able to to do the same thing a human can and is able to feel and be uh, like at the same level of cognition or general intelligence that we have. Um, and uh, just to briefly show an example, one of the things that have uh, one of the first topics that I work with are jellyfish, and it's based on a on a personal experience that I had in my childhood, where I developed a phobia of jellyfish. Um, and as I grew as an adult, I became fascinated visually with their shapes, and all I wanted to do was try to render jellyfish first. I started on 3D uh, trying to do that, but then when I found out about neural networks, I immediately tried to um, to do it, to use them to render jellyfish. And and yes, these are these are um, the jellyfish from from my data set of of my own cognitive um, that my own cognitive processes have somehow learned and yeah so another another one of the questions um is what are artificial neural networks teaching me about my own cognitive processes can i understand better how i see and how i look at things and how i process information through having to uh, for example create a neural network that can learn to extract patterns or to detect um, objects in an image. So I set myself to try to extract the visual essence of a jellyfish. I didn't want to recreate just jellyfish per se and to create like a realistic representation of a jellyfish, but I wanted to extract jellyfishness and something that looks uncanny in a way that we can say okay, this looks like jellyfish, but doesn't match any jellyfish that I've seen before. And this looks like equally, this looks like nature, but this doesn't look like a nature that I've experienced before. 
so this image has to be fake. Um, and I found out that I was not the only one asking myself these things and talking about um, these topics. And um, I, I highly recommend, if you're into this, um, reading the paper Visual Indeterminacy in GAN Art by Aaron Hertzman. Um, and in that paper, he talks about um, how artists have been doing this uh, since a long time already, and they've been trying to play with uh, what our visual perception can at first think that it's seeing something that makes sense, and then um, eventually to find out that there's no, that there's a lack of semantic there. So it's in a way, it's a promise of um, a semantic content in an image. And um, to go now in a different direction and share a bit of my inspirations kind of uh, overall, one of my uh, computational <laughs> inspirations is uh, the work from Carl Sims on evolved creatures. And he did this um, in 1994, in what was back then considered a supercomputer. I think for us now, it's no longer a supercomputer. Um, but what he did um, is fascinating. He created a 3D environment of simulated physics, basically. And um, he composed or he created these creatures that are basically made of 3D cubes. And they learn to walk or um, move around, sometimes swim or fly in this space. And he even made them interact with each other. So where they learn by themselves how to um, compete with each other for a goal, for a specific goal. And it's really interesting to see um, when you look at the behavior that they have and how these creatures adopt different uh, different strategies, like sometimes they compete with each other. One would grab the cube that is the red, that red uh, square that you see there and take it away uh, from the other one, or another one would just go and block the opponent. Um, I find his work absolutely fascinating and really recommend checking it out. Um, and the other, another one of my big inspirations, non-generative, this is all done uh, by hand, is the Codex Serafinianus from Luigi Serafini. And he made this book, which is basically a fabricated language. Um, and which, funnily enough, when you look at it, looks like um, every single time I, I somehow try to read it, and then I realize that I can't read that, um, that I can't possibly understand what's saying there. Um, and same same thing happens visually um, with this, for example, plants that look like they look like plants, but I never seen a plant like that before. So it's kind of nature rearranged. And he explores that not just in nature, but in a variety of things. He creates fashions, foods, um, yeah, organisms that are a combination, not just like chair with tree or whatever. Um, I really, really love this, this piece. So, um, so that led me to, um, to create this series called Neural Zoo, uh, which I've been working on on the past um, few years. Sophia, and we're going to interrupt you a little bit because actually uh, I want to bring, uh, we want to bring Marnie back on. Maybe we can discuss a bit more of your practice in dialogue with Marnie uh, since our time is quite compressed. I want to yeah. make sure that we can have a more synthetic discussion too, but this has been so fascinating. And also I love uh, every image you put up on the screen. I wish I could just screen capture so I could have it always in my, in my screen vision. If you want to briefly wrap up about uh, yes, neural, exactly. neural zoo uh, while we bring on Marnie though, please, please continue. And I was just going to show you uh, basically some of the things that I've generated and um, and how that uh, became eventually uh, into 3D as well. And 
yeah, I'm happy to to discuss with Marnie about this. So, okay, so um, a first question then that maybe could be a segue, and I see there's a question from Carolyn Frulich in the uh, questions. Uh, so I want to bring that in as well. Is a question of audience, right? So we think about beauty, and we know from Elaine Scarry and from other people, um, beauty is of course what is surprising or unexpected, or maybe even ugly in the mind of of the human, um, and we wonder who is the beauty for, who is it pleasing? Um, and there's sort of a two part tier to this question. One is um, like, where, where is the civic sphere for determining what is beautiful or what is valuable or money per your site, what is historically important? Um, we've always needed a, uh, a public forum. At one point that was media or that was museums, a uh, shared civic space. Um, and, and I wonder maybe Sophia, you could even start this by saying, where do you imagine your art being viewed and being not judged in like a, a bad sense, but by being uh, received? And, and by somebody saying, okay, you think this is beautiful and I think it's beautiful too. So now we have a consensus and now there's some value that's being built. Um, who, 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 is the, who is the ideal viewer, uh, viewer or the ideal arbiter of what is beauty for you? Okay, um, I have a lot to say about this but I'm gonna try to be brief. Um, I, I took beauty as a topic because I think it's one of the um, kind of old and standard definition of what art is, which I actually disagree with. I don't think that art should be the pursuit of beauty, um, or I think it's an incomplete um, definition of art. But I took this because I felt like it was relevant to how I how I felt about this. I think beauty is very subjective. It's hard to say, um, or even, yeah, beauty can be experienced in looking at something ugly as well. So I think it's, uh, it's much more than what it what it implies in a way. Um, Maybe the emphasis on the public sphere, like where do you imagine your art being received? And I think this also comes into Marnie providing an institution for it, but still even Marnie, I imagine that going to your website is going to AIartist.org is an insufficient way of actually connecting with the work. And I know, I also wanna throw in here another vector of artists increasingly using these off clearnet spaces to be together, these discord spaces, these telegram groups, these uh, Reddit spaces or personal blogs or, or semi-private spaces of sharing, uh, of sharing their art and building artistic discourse. And so where do we find a public space uh, like a, or a semi-private public space and uh, like a, an enclave, a club in the shadows, a space where we can decide, okay, yes, this is beautiful in this way. And we as a community feel this is beautiful. Um, where, where do we find those spaces of adjudication for art. Um, Where do you personally hope I, that your art is, is received? Oh, wait, was uh, it to Sophia or me? Oh, I, know, I guess to Sophia, just a, an extra prompt. Like, where do you imagine ideally your art being received? So you make this and you have a very personal relationship to that. And that's incredibly important. But then I wonder, where do you imagine when you imagine the viewer, where do you imagine them to be receiving your work? And where do you imagine to be receiving their feedback on how they perceive your work? Or for you, is that actually not even an issue? Um. I think to me, like this isn't something I think so much about because I think it's often uh, it's open to either like a public space or uh, even like a natural space. I'd be happy to show my work, you know, in a forest or in a park, um, in a place, of course, that would still be accessible to people. But I've even and now with COVID and everything, I been having to adapt to show it online. So I think before I was more uh, closed minded in like how I imagine or, or yeah, and how I imagine that I want to show my art ideally, but now I feel like I'm much more flexible than I was before. Um, yeah, because COVID has challenged me to think in different ways of communicating. And, and Marnie, also, what it, what in your experience? So you run an organization that brings together um, artists who are working in, you know, in, in the artists that you bring together. You're bringing them together because of their way of working, not necessarily because of their particular, like, ideological interests or their uh, the particular 
areas of critique they're working in. You're, it's simply like a mechanical common denominator. So where do you imagine the public space to be or the semi-private public space to be uh, for uh, communicating with this art, creating value around this art? Um, yes. I mean, that's an interesting question and, and multi-layered. And I would say, you know, the, the projects that we pick on our site I've selected as a curator. And so to ask a curator, what are you thinking about? So many things and narrative, um, you know, diversity and um, definitely who the artists are and who their perspectives are, diversity in the output. Um, and just, you know, my presentation, for example, showed a lot of different artists focusing on a lot of different things, the output being a lot of different ways. So that's, in a way, you know, an artist needs to sort of determine, just like Sophia was saying, what, what's the ideal space? And there's also, you know, uh, what's the ideal space for me to show my work? Um, we created the website with the intention. I mean, I think it's about, I mean, it's, it's about intention. And so it's the artist's intention about showing a piece or showing a body of work. It's, you know, um, for, for us, it was an educational tool and a connecting tool to have it online. Um, so I, I mean, I guess I would answer wherever, you know, people would find out about art, which is well, everywhere. I mean, it's I guess online, you can read. You can... Maybe this question though, would even be for something to discuss in the dialogue spaces. I guess my question is really the civic space. And like, we've always needed a civic space in order to have value for an art. Uh, the Raft of the Medusa, uh, a, a great piece like that. It needed, it needed, um, an audience to imbue it with value. It's not valuable until you have a social body. I think you're predicating this so. also upon the fact that in this uh, institutions and the art world as it existed in the past few decades is sort of being disrupted and right in now, a state of absolutely. decline. And right. And when we have this individualizing, atomizing online space, one of the key problems I see is a uh, an atomized social body. And you no longer have spaces to actually say, well, I think it looks red. I think it looks blue. This is why I think it looks red. This is why I think it looks blue. Oh, this is actually a color I've never seen before. Even though Sophia, you maybe have seen this color before. I think we need those spaces. And so I feel like this one problem that really needs to be solved are better institutional spaces or para-institutional spaces for building community, maybe artist up community. And we know right now the clear net spaces, the Facebooks, the Twitter, they are actually like separating us ever more. They are terrible spaces for building community around discussing art without a social body, a, a community, an artist community, a bar, a club, an underground of some sort, you're not going to have like any kind of heat around the artist being made. And so I just wonder as, as a curator and as an artist, if you see any of those spaces emerging that you feel are particularly interesting. And Marnie, the space that you provide is a great nexus. It's a great resource for, you know, here's a bunch of links on, on uh, different AI conversations, different AI resources. If you're interested in using AI, here's a portal for finding out how to get access to those resources. Here or other artists um, from all over the world who are working with this, that's fantastic. But that seems like that, that is one element. Um, I wonder where do we find that civic space? The museums are all trying to answer this question as well. But as a curator and as an artist, do you see anything that's particularly exciting to you? Where do you go to get your civic inspiration or your community inspiration? Especially when there's, uh, yes, especially when there's no, uh, when we're in COVID. But I also see that there's a question that we should take some more audience questions. But if you have, further thoughts on that, um, yes, please, please say. Um, I think it's a, I think it's just a complicated question. Like, I, I don't think that there's one body of work of art that you can say, where's that civic space that you go? And it's just that like one type of art. I think it's, 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 it's having conversations with artists. I think it's having conversations with curators. I think it's being connected into like the larger, um, you know, what's happening. Um, you know, we, we try to do that on the site, you know, and we do to an extent, but, you know, I mean, that's not really our, um, you know, that's not our aim to be sort of this like civic space because that's a lot to ask for from, I think it's just many different things. And I think many different organizations and, and many different communities just have different interests or intentions. And um, it's just a complex, it's a, it's, there's just many things. It depends sort of what you're, what you're more, I mean, do you want to learn how to make artwork? Do you want to just talk with other artists who are like using the same thing? Are you an artist that's never used machine learning and, and, you know, 
you're an older artist, right? And, and where do you connect with, you know, a technologist where you guys can work together collaboratively to, to create something? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't have an answer. I don't have like a specific answer. I can you, say I, uh, a few things came to my mind, actually. Uh, one of the ideal places for me is a natural history museum, because not just because I love natural history and also it's the new uh, series that I'm working on is artificial natural history, but also because I think it's a place where we learn both about nature and science, how humans have uh, studied nature throughout time. So it's a place where we learn also about technology and the natural world, both things together. So they they aren't separated. And another place that um, that I would love to, I never had the chance yet uh, to show my work is in a botanical garden. Um, also because it's a place where we go to with the intention of experiencing nature, but it isn't a natural place per se because we don't have natural uh, botanical gardens without humans. So it's a place that we created like a sphere um, that's a public space to experience nature. And that's what I that's what I want to do, but without trying to, you know, replace nature, just trying to experience that also digitally. So um, so yeah, these are two spaces. <laughs> I love that idea. And I think that is such an important thing to say that we do already have these institutions that maybe are perfect backdrops for a perfect contextualizing IRL spaces for engaging with art that's using very new technology, botanical gardens and natural history museums. Absolutely. And we should also look to these older institutions and understand how they might recontextualize that or, or newly contextualize um, the, this machine learning based art. A, a question from the audience from uh, Marcus Huber. Uh, Sophia Crespo talks about ANN, that uh, artificial neural networks, not artificial intelligence. It seems there's a certain blur when it comes to the definition of AI and the use of the term AI in the arts. And uh, he asked her your opinion on that. Uh, should we define these terms more specifically, even though the public, I think, just sort of uh, has an understanding of all of these things grouped within AI, but maybe some more granularity is necessary. Maybe we share your thoughts. Uh, I went through different phases um, of uh, feeling uh, about this. I went through a phase where I was like, oh, no, I don't like the AI as a definition. You know, AI has changed so much and is like the, the what we defined as AI has changed so much throughout time. And, you know, back in the day, you could call a calculator an artificial intelligence just because for all we knew, um, a calculator could do all those calculations that a human couldn't just directly compute um, in such a short period of time. So, so this is something that I was thinking, oh, maybe that could be kind of devious in a way or not very uh, clear about the technology. So I'm going to stick to the technical terms for what I'm doing. Um, there's also the, the issue that uh, is mentioned in a few books that I read about AI and ethics, about the danger of the hype and describing AI as a thing that is intelligent, that can understand, that can, uh, well, understand the same way that we consider uh, understanding, and that can create something from a place of being, um, of being conscious. And if we give it too much agency, then we get to the problem that Marnie was talking about before with bias and all, well, all the bias that we have um, in the technology. So, so yeah, but eventually I, um, I decided that I kind of reconciled with the term AI and I still, um, I still use most of the time the technical terms for what I do, but I still, I, I use AI now <laughs> for my work. <laughs> and Marnie, and also, uh, I mean, the biases and blind spots of, of AI, what, what does that mean for artists working within this field of machine learning, artificial neural networks, artificial intelligence, gener generative adversarial networks? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's artists that I, I read that question and I wasn't sure exactly that I understood because um, so there's artists like Stephanie who are are utilizing these technologies to highlight biases and um, you know, just because, you know, humans are, are humans and there, you know, you might not know, you know, if, if I grow up in a specific culture, I might not know anything about another culture, but does that mean that that culture shouldn't be re reflected in, you know, AI and machine learning technologies? No. So I think that that's very, in, very important work that artists are doing. So they're highlighting these biases of underrepresented cultures um, through this technology. Um, underrepresented cultures in the general, you know, contextual whose story is actually really heard, but also the people who are doing these, uh, the, you know, it tends to be w white male, you know, American um, that are creating these technologies. So um, one of the things that Stephanie is very passionate about is, is, is many people learning more about these technologies and utilizing these technologies as an artist or how, however, so they can understand how they work and they can, you know, contribute different data sets and there can be more of an educated conversation conversation about it. But maybe the question is, uh, so the artists that are creating the artwork, they have their own biases. Maybe that's the question as well. And I would say absolutely. And I, and I think the artists would absolutely agree with that as well. I think, you know, what the artists are, what certain artists that are working kind of with this idea are trying to do though, is even the playing field. So instead of just having one dominant narrative or a couple of, you know, very small dominant narratives and um, Octavio talks a lot about this in, in his work um, when he was doing his presentation. So, you know, you have, you know, money and accessibility, it's, it's expensive to use this, you know, these processing powers if you're making new data sets. I mean, there's many, many different considerations um, that artists don't necessarily have access to this technology or learning that, you know, who's getting to learn it, who's making these data sets, because those are going to be the ones that are used and kind of the dominant, uh, the dominant narrative. So I hope that answers that question. I mean, perhaps it's just artists need to make uh, be responsible for uh, being aware of the biases that might develop in, in their models uh, or the blind spots. Of course, these biases come from the data itself. So, uh, I mean, I like to imagine artificial intelligence as almost being this uh, world oracle or world psychoanalyst of sorts that is able to uh, read all of the data we generate online. Uh, unfortunately, we tend to act as uh, worse human beings online than we do in uh, <laughs> the organic world. Um, but uh, AI can, from this macroscopic view, uh, end up finding uh, th those biases and reflecting back to us something that can often be a bit uh, scary. So I, I think there's a lot of room for artists to, uh, I mean, uh, maybe exercise some responsibility within the models they're using, but uh, also the biases within the models they're using can be the interesting point of criticism for the art itself, of course. In fact, oh, maybe we could oh. even bring Marcus, oh, sorry, uh, Marcus and Octavio back on now. And then, yes, sorry, Sophia, please, please do answer. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I don't think the bias is only in the model or only in the data set. Actually, I, uh, at some point I realized, okay, I'm trying to represent nature in this field, you know, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking, um, what to me is aesthetically pleasing nature and there's a bias there you know which nature is beautiful for me to look at and which one isn't you know um because i'm showing like nature portrayed in a in a specific way and i'm not showing other nature so just wanted to say that um that i re when i realized that i was like whoa okay yeah <laughs> um and I, I was aware of that bias. And it's actually uh, something that I actually like talking about. Did you want to mention this? Oh, yeah. Um, also, maybe we also bring on Octavio as well. Uh, he he um, might not be with us. Oh, there okay, he is. Super. Great. OK, great. Okay. Um, there, there's also this question that we touched on yesterday um, regarding artists being instrumentalized as uh, R&D for tech. Oops. 
Um, and I wonder both as an artist, how you might feel or what we think maybe the dangers are when we start thinking about art as merely an illustrative tool or as, as a place to solve text problems. Um, or maybe Marcus or Octavio, this is a question for you to answer. Where is that line? What happens when we start fetishizing work that is made with AI as, oh, this is art, but is it art or is it just, you know, art, uh, you know, a, a visual expression that is made using a new technology. And this is of course, nothing new. The same thing happened with the camera or with video games or anything else. Um, so do we have thoughts on the dangers of, uh, of instrumentalizing artists beyond like what art really means? I think using the camera as an analogy is quite an interesting one because that was a moment when a new piece of technology came on the scene and we were able to, you know, and it, 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 had, it was very challenging because, um, you know, what, what is an artist doing now? Isn't that just replicating what we're seeing? But actually we could, you know, artists found a way to use that as an amazing tool to see the world in, in a new way. Um, and I think that's uh, the power of this tool now. And, and I think it's a really important role, which has been mentioned before, I think, but it needs accentuating, which is, um, you know, the artist and, and culture is going to play a very significant role in us examining this new technology, which is uh, having such a massive impact on society. And I, I think, um, you know, that's why I highlighted uh, Deep Dream as, you know, visually very uninteresting. I mean, it's, uh, but uh, intellectually and philosophically, I think very important because these, you know, we've all, I, I believe that our creativity emerged when our consciousness did as a, as a species, that it was our tool for probing this weird thing that emerged in the human species. And I think we should be, uh, it, it'll be very interesting to use AI art and AI creativity as a way of examining this inner world, which isn't conscious yet, doesn't have emotions, but it is uh, mysterious. Uh, because it's so complex that we don't understand how how it's making its decisions. I think there's a role uh, of the artist being, you know, having a huge agency in in, in examining um, this emerging technology. Thank you. Yes, I, I wonder also if if maybe Sophia, if you have thoughts, or Octavio, if you have thoughts on this. I definitely have thoughts on this, and it's something that we've discussed with other artists too. Uh, when does a piece become art? And when does it when when is it not yet art and when does it begin being art and it's something that we, well what we arrived to the conclusion in that conversation was that art has intention and that the intention comes from the human because I had people look at my work or uh, hear that it's made with AI and they asked me um just a random person in the plane uh, once asked me okay you work with AI, um, so you don't do art. The AI does everything for you. So what do you actually do? And I was like, well, um, just getting to run this AI can <laughs> take me a whole week of installing dependencies. <laughs> but um, yeah. I, I think that word intention, I mean, I it came up a lot in my book. Intentionality is still coming from the human. I mean, AlphaGo, did not want to play that game of Go. Uh, the human started it off and, uh, and it was running. And I, I think intentionality will be really interesting when AI becomes conscious, which it will, I think, at some stage, but a very long way down the road. Um, and it will have the need to share it in, a, you know, that something's going on. And then the intention will be coming uh, from within the code. At the, at the moment, uh, that's all with the human. And we should regard this as as a tool and not over hype it. I think that was really important. Um, there's a lot of, you know, my toothpaste has been created with AI. I mean, uh, you know, it's like the dot com era. Now everybody puts created by AI as a kind of tag to to show they're part of this new revolution. Yes, and we should also- yeah, and I'll just- Okay, sorry. I'll just, uh, sorry, I'll just hop in on that really fast because being a curator, people are asking me, what is art the same, like Sophia was talking about, and also what is good art? Like, how do you, how do you know that? And one of the big things that I would say is intentionality. It, you know, if you don't have a reason why it's not a mirror, it's not philosophical, it's not deep, you know, and it's just sort of like, I did this like, you know, pretty thing, or, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I mean, it is really hard to run a machine learning technology. So that's all, that's a whole other thing too. But I mean, there is this distinction that that I have is there you have a creative technologist and then you have an artist. 
And I think that there's a big difference. I think creative technologists know the technology and they're like, this is cool. Like, let me mess around with this. Let me see what happens. That's great. And artists can do that too. But usually there's more philosophical, there's more intention, there's more, it's deeper. It's like meteor. It's, 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 you want to like, it, it's, it's, it's deep. Yeah. Whereas other things, you know, just exploring for fun. Hey, this looks cool. And I, you know, got it printed at, you know, whatever, CVS or something, you know, it's, it's just totally different. Right. I mean, we know from the pictures generations, just the displacement of an advertisement from the magazine to uh, canvas, Richard Prince or somebody, uh, and you have an artistic gesture, of course, famously Duchamp or, you know, the avant-garde is usually taking something that already exists and then using it in a way that has a particularly human intention. So I imagine we could right. make an analogy there. Um, maybe to just yeah. um, fine tune that question. What about art washing? I mean, we see so much, uh, we see, uh, you know, we exist very much between this tech and art space. And we find that as soon as you step into the tech sphere, there is this, oh, but don't worry, we have this artist, we have an artist ambassador who is, uh, who is working with us. Oh, they're not a technologist, they're actually an artist. Or look at our lobby, look at this artist that has intervened. Are there concerns about this art washing? I mean, uh, or is it actually going to be the artist's job to, or maybe the curator's job to defend against this? What kind of like gatekeeping do we have? And maybe that's the wrong word, but what kind of, I don't know, like what kind of borders do we create or, or how do we create a framing that, that doesn't just have technologists, uh, the tech companies thinking that they're including artists and therefore have been like washed of their sins? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, so I, I mentioned Bell Labs earlier and um, actually I, I did um, for the Guta Institute in San Francisco, we had Bell Labs. We had the director of the um, artist uh, experiment in art and technology program, um, the current program that's running. They first did this in the sixties with uh, Rauschenberg and it was called it was Nine Evenings and it was nine evenings of performances where artists were using technology um, that they were, that they had worked with um, engineers from Bell Labs. And um, it was a really great sort of, um, almost like the Renaissance, right? Like artists and, uh, and science, you know, together. So there was a lot of, um, of inspiration. There was a lot of innovation. Um, and then um, Bell Labs has restarted that program. Um, and I would say it's a very successful program. It's not art washing because, and this is something that, you know, they, they, the guys from Bell, we had an artist that, was a part of the program and the director Dunal, and then a woman who had done a bunch of research in the 60s um, on it and and why you know it was successful and why it was different and why it's different is because it's not an easy fix you can't you know um, it's a relationship it's like time energy and effort they you got to have got to support each other got to know each other you know um, artists would come into Bell Labs now they can't so that a relationship is evolving you know it, it, it's a it's sort of like a, a you know a deep-seated thing and um, that is very different and it's ongoing with their uh, you know long-term residents and now the long-term residents are actually informing the technology that Bell Labs is creating where they tried to hire an outside like ad firm or an outside uh, not ad firm but like experience design firm and 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 uh, to help them with some of the technology that they were trying to create for their clients and it wasn't they weren't it wasn't working and so they were you they were working with the artists that are part of like this long-term program that works with them and and it was it, it fit a lot a lot better and this is sort of around um you know I don't want to say humanizing technology but like you know human-centered research kind of technology focused stuff I um I wanted to mention something um I like the metaphor of the honeybees um, that I heard in a podcast uh, recently, how um, honeybees are producing honey, but they don't do it for us. Um, but eventually, you know, uh, that's beneficial to us because we can eat the honey, right? And in the same way, I think that it doesn't, like to some extent it doesn't really matter if they're art watching as long as they're employing art <laughs> i mean i'm i'm um and uh because i think it is important uh as long as, as soon as you start to incorporate all these uh critical 
and different pers just different perspectives, not necessarily critical, um, then that's already something that's contributing to culture. And, you know, maybe it doesn't come always from the best of intentions, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Can I add something? I'll just say, yeah. yeah. Oh, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, in general, it's it's clear that the artists are treated, or arts in general, is treated as a secondary or a peripheral dimension in in the in in AI in the AI world, and actually this is uh, not really fair because actually it was uh, the arts and the cultural sector who were uh, really the pioneers in AI and automation. If you take uh, that there are so many novels that came avant la lettre. So um, before the, the before science developed the 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 the, the, fun, the fundamentals of automation, well, you, we had the Iliad um, two thousand five hundred years ago, where Hephaestus were, was working with automated uh, machines that were helping him in his tasks, and then we had uh, so many yeah theater plays such as uh, Rossum's Universal Robots. You know, we, we say robot because of that play, that play by Karel Czapek in the 1920s. Robot means slave in, in Czech, robota. So why we are using robots in science is that that's because of a theater play. And, and when we say artificial intelligence, artificial means made with art. So it's not that we should add artists as something nice to have in the equation, but something that is key and, and fu absolutely fundamental for the very development of AI. If we don't include the artists in, in the discussion, then we will have deep problems in the long run. For, for example, the question of biases. What is a bias? Um, if you see a bias, it's, it's a cultural stereotype. So if we, if you, let's say in Freudian terms, if we repress culture and, and the arts uh, here, it will come back uh, in, in another form, in, under the form of biases. So I think it's absolutely essential, not just for the artists, but for the very development of AI and science to put art at the core of the discussion in when, whenever we, we talk about AI. And maybe that's actually a good place to wrap up as we're now to the end of our session. Um, yes, keep art centered and maybe make informal spaces for art to happen, not ones that are only directed upwards towards extraction. I know we heard about this a bit last night. Informal spaces for AI to open up new areas of possibility for artists to think as humans. Um, and then I love Sophia. I love that that analogy of, of honey, mm -hmm. though, that then, you know, maybe maybe that honey can, if there's an excess, can be used by corporations. So non-instrumentalized artistic production um, aided and opened up by AI. Um, we uh, we well, now- Remember the bees are given sugar water in return. That's true, yeah. So it's not always so good for, uh, <laughs> for, for, for the artist. There is a balance, there is an ecosystem here, right? Um, and uh, we need to make sure that there's informal spaces, there's spaces in the shadows, there's, there's spaces that are like outside of you where stuff can also happen. Because of course, Octavio, as you said, if there's not space for that, it will come back in forms of polarization, in forms of biases, in forms that are um, uh, like a lot more harmful to, uh, to the way we think and the way we are together. Shall we uh, invite people to? Yes, I think now we should actually, we need to, unfortunately, we need to close uh, this session, but this has been incredibly interesting these past two hours. Thank you so much, Marcus, Octavio, Marnie, Sophia. Um, we are now going to invite uh, listeners to join us in wander.me. Pedro or Robert or somebody who's working on the tech end could maybe uh, drop that link into the chat. Um, okay. And, uh, and that is this informal dialogue space where you can speak directly with us, but also perhaps some of the speakers who are, uh, who have time in their schedule. Um, it takes a second, if you're not already familiar with it, just a second to log on. It's very intuitive. You're represented by a small circle and you drag that circle into proximity uh, where other people's circles are discussing and you'll be allowed into their conversation. So it, uh, it gives you uh, some room to explore and a sort of spatial interface uh, in order to join new conversations and meet new people. If you're using it, you wanna make sure that you're logged out of Zoom or at least have your Zoom muted. And it's always best to use headphones so that there's not an e echo. 
Um, so and to mute yourself when using Wonder. Oh yeah, and me and because there's many voices in the room exactly, at a time. Exactly, exactly. Basic Zoom etiquette, uh, online video etiquette, which I'm sure you're all now very skilled in. Um, so that concludes this session. Uh, we would ask, uh, we would invite you to join us again tonight at 6 p.m. Central European time, 9 a.m. for those in California, for our digital art experience session featuring stream performances by artists Hexor Sismos and Yana Sutella, both of whom with, work with and through machine learning. And we'll continue maybe some of the themes that were opened up today in this session with Yana and with Hexor Sismos tonight. Um. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's it. We'll just say the credits again. Thank you again to Gita Chalk, uh, who came up with the concept for this week's conference, the curation and production by Jeanette Neustadt of the Goethe Institute, Pedro Yardim of New Kin Co, who did the technical production, along with animations and more technical support by Tim Novikov. The graphic design is by Amelie Bakker and Atelier Brenda. The coordination is Lina Kiryatsoviate and Giacomo Corongio and Robert Keefe, and I'm Caroline Busta. Julian Wadsworth from New Models. Hope you join us tonight for what's the uh, early after party of sorts uh, yeah. <laughs> with our uh, stream performances before tomorrow, the uh, last, uh, last day where we focus on AI and education uh, with a particular focus on language learning. Thank you all for joining us. Signing off from Berlin, see you on Wonder. Don't believe.